namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputassa putang dhammang sankhang namasami so good evening to everyone wherever you might be If thinking or believing in reborn or rebirth is or could be avijja, and there is no rebirth to next life, no matter what or where, how does rule of karma could apply to this? Please kindly elaborate and clarify as rules of karma and incarnation appear to make Buddhism different from others. Um, when I, when I said to the question that the thought that I uh, will be reborn or won't be reborn, I said that was avijja. It's not, it's not about rebirth. It's about self. That's the issue. It's not saying that, that there are no consequences to actions. There are consequences to wholesome actions and unwholesome actions, obviously. Well, we all know that if I, if I were yelling at you for one week, you wouldn't feed me, <laughs> right? So there's obviously this consequences to action. Um, and there are, there are moral consequences. So if I, if I were to be really cruel to people and exploitive of people, my mind would be like hell, you know, I'd be drilling in hell. Or if I was, compassionate and caring then my mind would be divine and then on a larger level then we speculate you know, some people know something and that's definitely true so avijja is not that issue and 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 you know teachings about karma and reincarnation they're not unique to buddhism you know if you think about christianity it has a sort of heaven and hell right and there are consequences to good action and bad action. And they, and they formulate it in different ways than we do. But, I mean, that's pretty common in most cultures that there are reward and punishment kind of teachings go on. And then sometimes those are used in a very fearful way. If you don't behave yourself, you're going to go to hell. And you find that in Buddhism too, right? You know, if you, well, what is it? Well, you know, if you speak badly, you're going to be ugly in the next life and things like that. And, and so that's the sort of theory of crime and punishment, <laughs> which might be good for society to keep people in line. I, I don't know. But certainly on a, on, a, on a present lifetime level, we all know there are consequences. Life is consequential. Everything I say or think or do has consequences. But the real... I mean, the really interesting thing about Buddhism is anatta. And so when we were talking about we having this uh, dialogue about what we were having about, <laughs> uh, the, 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 when, I, when I said that, that very statement is avijja, it wasn't the statement about rebirth. There was a, a statement about me being someone who was born 70, how many, five years ago. And then I will die in, what's, what, what do they say? I think 82. So I've got, I think my average for my, my type is 82. I'll die in, seven, that's seven years, right? But that's, that's the sense of self, you see. And that's really the nub of Buddhism. And I, I don't know if it's unique to Buddhism, but maybe it's unique to Indian culture because it comes out of Indian culture. And then the Buddha refines that and feeds it back into Indian culture. So that's, that. I mean, that's a very good question because the heart of Buddhism is more about emptiness and shunyata or anatta. And those are really difficult things to, to understand because they're counterintuitive. But let me just read you what Lompa Cha said. A visiting Zen student asked Ajahn Chah, how old are you? Do you live here all year round? I live nowhere, he replied. 
There is no place you can find me. I have no age. To have age, you must exist. And to think you exist is already a problem. Don't make problems. Then the world has none either. Don't make a self. There's nothing more to say. Wow. <laughs> now, Lovacha didn't teach like that very often. Right? He didn't like most of the time. You know, not most, I don't know. I, I wasn't there that long. But from what I understand, when I was there, a lot of the teaching was just telling the monks to shape up. So if the monks were sleeping all afternoon and then just cooey gunning for two hours in the evening, he'd say, eat little, sleep little, talk little in that context. Or he'd say, you guys, your kutis are just really sloppy. What do you think this is? And that would go for three hours. <laughs> so these kinds of teachings were, were, were quite, quite rare. Um, and yet they were there. And these are the highest teachings. And the highest teachings, and they're not always applicable because it's hard to understand, and and uh, it's easier to understand sila and dana. Once there was a layman who came to Ajahn Chah and asked him who Ajahn Chah was. Ajahn Chah, seeing that the spiritual development of the individual was not very advanced, pointed to himself and said, "This is this this is Ajahn Chah." On another occasion, someone else asked Ajahn Chah the same question this time. However, seeing that the questioner's capacity to understand the Dhamma was higher, Ajahn Chah answered by saying, Ajahn Chah, there is no Ajahn Chah. A devout elderly lady from a nearby province came on a pilgrimage to Wat Bapong. She told Ajahn Chah, she could stay only a short time. She had to return to take care of her grandchildren. And since she was an old lady, she asked if he could please give her a brief Dhamma talk. Ajahn Chah replied with great force, hey, listen, there's no one here, just this, no owner, no one to be old, to be young, to be good or bad or weak or strong, just this, that's all. Just various elements of nature going their own way, all empty, no one born and no one to die, those who speak of birth and death are speaking the language of ignorant children. In the language of the heart of Dhamma, there are no such things as birth and death. Wow. Right? And again, I mean, she was lucky. <laughs> she got that, ooh, right? right. Ooh. He must have really respected her. You know, because he, I, I never... I never, I, well, of course, my tie was not very good. Maybe he was saying it all the time. But I, 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 I don't think I ever saw him speak in that way. It was more like how to practice with things. It is so easy once you understand. It is so simple and direct. When pleasant things arise, understand that they are empty. When unpleasant things arise, see that they are not yours. They pass away. Don't relate to them as being you or see yourself as the owner of them. You think that papaya tree is yours, then why don't you feel hurt when it is cut down? If you can understand this, then the mind comes into balance. When the mind comes into balance, then this is the correct path, the correct teaching of the Buddha, and the teaching that leads to liberation. So, we, you know, we as meditators can contemplate this. Um, not everyone can, and, and so you wouldn't kind of mention it to everyone and if you think about like again how popular buddhism seems to operate there seems to be like one one vein of thinking is to try to get a good rebirth right so you want a good family and lots of cappuccino right this is this is <laughs> this is why i practice i want to i want comfort or 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 um, and all the rest of it and then the other way is I don't want rebirth, right? Because life is such a bummer, you know, and it's so painful. And, I, and both, are, both are still uh, atavada or sakaya ditti. I'm someone that doesn't want to be reborn or I'm someone that uh, wants to be reborn. And, and what we're doing is, it is the highest teaching. And, and you kind of... It's the kind of thing that you, you present to people only if they have a sense of dana and sila, that they're living good lives. And, and you all live good lives. You may not think so, but 
take it from me. <laughs> and and like, like for me to be here is a great good fortune and to share this space with you, to sit silently. How many people can sit silently and not look at their iPhones? <laughs> I just sit there and bear with knee pain and blah, blah, blah in the mind. Uh, so you may think that your, you know, your practice wasn't very good today, but actually, you know, when you step outside, this is tough work. It's very difficult work. And intellectually also, you, you're not given much. Every time you, you know, you take a position, someone undermines it, my nah. You know, you have, pray, you have nothing to hold on to. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging path. And, and I think you, you should all reflect that all of us have a lot of bar me. There's a lot of, a lot of goodness needs to come together just socially for us to have this fabulous place. Huh? Isn't it just, just the most wonderful, Deva Loka? Um, and then to, to, to be with like-minded people who have um, good values and, and have good minds to think and contemplate. Uh, and that we have like Kalyanamitta, that we can trust each other. We don't have to lock our doors or, or whatever people have to do when they don't trust each other. Um, and then to have that, that spiritual friendship of Kalyanamitta where we can talk about Dhamma and, and be enthusiastic about the higher values. All of this is, is probably why we can contemplate sunyata and anatta, because all of that is in place. If that wasn't in place, then the teaching would be, uh, no, stop robbing the bank. You must not do that. This is not a good idea. <laughs> So it'd be a different kind of teaching. Um, so, so you have, so I think to con constantly look in how culture is talking about um, Buddhism and, and, and then you want to get to the more, um, shall we say, more accurate, more accurate representations of the teaching which are like that, they're very powerful. Not, and, and you don't have to just correct everyone that you see on the street, right? No, it's empty. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that, you would be in trouble. But, but you can then begin to monitor, I would, well, what's the word? You can begin to judge for yourself when, when, when discussion in groups is, is filled with atavada, with self-view. And, and so much, so much of it will be, won't be, right? And, and what kind of a rebirth did they have? And uh, what did they do in the past life to get that? You know, what happened to them? And, and, and which is kind of Buddhist gossip, isn't it? Oh, which is not wrong. And, and I don't know. I mean, and again, when I say I don't know, I don't, that doesn't mean I disbelieve it. You're not, I'm not dismissing, and I do believe in consequences. Life is consequential. Intentional is consequential. So you have, when you, in, in moral philosophy, you have, you have this kind of moral problem. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people, and why do good things happen to bad people? And that's a kind of quandary any, any society probably has to raise and how to encourage society to be moral. And so the way what we use, we use the, the, the laws of karma uh, and, and then to say uh, that there are no consequences to like killing and stealing. No, Buddhism say, no, there are consequences. But then when you ask, and how do those consequences play out in other realms of consciousness? We don't know. And, and the Buddha would say to try to really figure that out. Would, it's too difficult. The human intellect isn't, isn't um, vast enough for that. It would drive a, a human being crazy, right? So, so that's one of the un... Um, uh, what's the word? It's, it's one of the questions which is not profitable. Not that it's not valid. It's a valid question, but it's not profitable in terms of what the Buddha was teaching. And the Buddha was teaching suffering and the end of suffering. So if you see for yourself, there are consequences to indulging in anger and there are consequences from trying to work on anger and let go of anger, then you understand the law of kama, and that's sufficient. That's sufficient. 
having said that, uh, we will, as Buddhists, use the idea of, of rebirth to come to a sense of acceptance. So, um, um, like my friend who got ripped off by his friend uh, and ran away with the money, after a year he said, oh, they pro I probably owed them from the past life. So that's a good strategy, right? Um, he didn't know, but it was a, a skillful ubai. We, we say it's a skillful means. So what are the skillful means we come to accept the way things are? You could use a law of karma, but someone who has no belief in that might just come to say, well, it's just the way it is. Podi. And it would be the same acceptance. They would have a different moral philosophy, but they would still be the same of acceptance. So maybe that's a more important issue. How do I accept the way things are rather than say they shouldn't be this way or whatever? And then from that acceptance, you know, that's a way to, it's like this. It's like that. So if 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 you if you find that language useful, great. <clears throat> so if I break my leg, um, then I could say I kicked a dog in a past life, okay? Or I've got macular degeneration. <laughs> Whatever you want, but the leg is broken. It's like this because <laughs> I just accept it, man. Um, so not not to dismiss the cultural uses of Buddhism, but quite often they are cultural uses. Um, you wouldn't want to you like the cultural use of fear is a bit tricky. Like, who did I meet? I met someone that was a Thai, Thai friend whose parents were pretty rough on him. And he said, so if he misbehaved, they'd lock him in a cupboard and say, the ghost is going to get you. And he, and at, at 45 years, he was still paranoid. His mind was messed up. And, you know, that was a, a cultural misuse of ghosts. <laughs> cruel, really, really cruel, right? So, I mean, that, 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 that's an exaggeration. Um, but it is good to sort of, like, as a, as a community, if, if we're talking with people and their cultural beliefs are starting to go to wrong view, you kind of grossly wrong view, then we can try to steer them to right understanding, maybe not the highest, but some way where what, where we, we take, like the, 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 say the misuse of law, law of karma would be fatalism. You know, I've just, I've just got, I've just got, I'm just a drunk. That's my karma. I'm just meant to be a drunk and take yaba. And <laughs> that's just, you know, my karma, which is wrong view. Right, it's fatalism. So that's a misuse of it. Or, or someone else says um, is disabled, and you look at them. You look at them in a kind of uh, uh, lacking in compassion. And say, well, you probably, yeah, you probably robbed banks in a past life. That's you know, which would be really cruel, wouldn't it? So you could see how you could misuse. You misuse these ideas. So always the Brahma Viharas are important. Personal responsibility is important. Seeing cause and effect is important. In any way, the Buddhist uh, teachings help us to do that is good. But we wouldn't want to just live from fear. Well, I, I guess it would be, you know, it's good to be afraid of robbing a bank. It's probably kind of a healthy fear. But in, 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 uh, in the Abrahamic religion, say, uh, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, and, and Judaism. We call that the Abrahamic religions because it comes from Abraham. Um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear and guilt and, and uh, really, really horrible kind of mind states because some of the teaching have been used in that way, you know, that you, like you were born with original sin. That's a horrible idea. We don't have that in Buddhism. You know, you've just got work to do, mate. <laughs> whatever reason but there isn't there isn't an idea of like even um the translation of bop as sin it, 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 it's not a really good translation i know that's what a dictionary would say but sin is a particularly kind of christian word and it has connotations that you are that you are inherently um not good and it's only that this deity is around that you're liberated from being not good. And we don't have that. We don't have that at all. We just have their suffering and the end of suffering. And, and that we as human beings have a possibility to end suffering. 
like let's say the issue about tanha is not an issue that tanha is bad like like in some western religious traditions like greed is bad um sexuality is bad um wanting comfort is bad you know there's a kind of sinful quality to it we're not saying it's bad it's just i mean you're looking in the wrong place that's all comfort i mean yeah be comfortable but don't make it your lifestyle so it's much more much more kind of accepting i would say it's very accepting of the whole range of human human uh, stuff but it's just pointing to there are consequences first of all so be careful live a good life but there is this there is this possibility the realization of nibbana and as a monk obviously that's my hobby you know that's why i signed up <laughs> So that's why I'm always dwelling on it. Like, and maybe I should talk more about Sila and Dana, but I think you know that. I mean, you live it. So, you know, so, so that's why I kind of go to these kind of topics. And, and, and when, we, when I was talking about Sila Bhatta Paramasa, cultural attachment, it's a very interesting one to look at how, you know, you, you culturally interpret some of the buddhist buddhist ideas like the thing about i am i don't want to be reborn is it is a commonplace isn't it we, we all say that <laughs> most of us meditators i don't want any more <laughs> kind of. uh and yet it's it's not really accurate because it's assuming a sense of self and and, and the teachings are challenging that and it, and, and I mean, i'll say that too i mean it's you know it, it's not that we have to be language police. Well, you said it. <laughs> you know, it's it's not that to, to be kind of politically Buddhist correct. It's more just to realize, okay, that's just fun language. That's just cultural language. That's just the way we play around. But you know, where the the real reality, like Lompa Chas, Uju Patipano, you know, he's right, right, kind of going right to the right to the heart of it. So I hope that answers that. Please kindly provide some thoughts on Sama Samadhi, its role on strengthening the awakening mind and increasing awareness, how to increase and incorporate practice of Samadhi in daily life. So I, I, I use, I don't like to use the word concentration, and that's the common English translation. Um, I like to use the words more like composure and collectedness. And to me, it seems that the Buddhist project is suffering and the end of suffering. And its main um, what, what would be the word? Its main element is the awakened mind. Right? So not a particular state of mind. To me, it seems it's the awakened mind. Because from that awakened mind, there's a possibility to, to see cause and effect. So then my, my sense of it, how, how can one sustain the awakened mind? And then how can one use that in, in awakened mind to investigate suffering, its causes, and its end? So samadhi, samadhi must be in line with that, rather than just some state of mind that I get, somehow not related to the whole work in the project the buddhist liberation whereas for me as i said earlier the word concentration it, it's really a word I, I use more about the objects so if i'm again if i'm using a table saw which is going at twenty thousand revolutions for um, whatever it's really dangerous and and you know i i put this thumb through a saw you see the difference in size Exhibit A, don't ever do that. <laughs> so I, I had a, uh, this was in New Zealand in 1990 or something. So I had the table saws running, right? And I had a piece of wood and I had a push stick, which slipped off and my thumb went into the blade. Great story, huh? I didn't remember. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and then um, I said, oh. No. <laughs> so then someone got some 
frozen peas and corn. That's it. It was, it was, a, it was, it was frozen peas and corn, and they put it on top, right? To, to kind of, so then, I, then we went to the, to the hospital, and I'm, I'm hyperventilating now, <laughs> kind of crazy. And uh, the triage nurse takes it apart, and she says, ah, oh, what a mess. <laughs> And she asked me, well, what do you do? Well, I'm a monk. I said, yeah, but what do you do? Well, I don't know, I'm a monk. <laughs> and she said, okay. And then I had to wait for quite a while. And then they gave me, <laughs> I wasn't intending to talk about this. <laughs> they, they gave me an arm block, uh, a shot. So, and, 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 and they put a screen around my face. And one nurse kind of just talked with me to make sure I wasn't freaking out. And they operated on it. And it was in, I couldn't feel anything because I had an arm block. And, I, and it was interesting that this, there was a man and a woman surgeons and they talked, started to talk about their lunch. You know, as they're, as they're sewing up my, my thumb, I think, so what should, Indian or, or Chinese? What should we have? <laughs> and I, you know, that's an insight. You know? To them, it's like sewing clothes, I guess. So then, um, the, so they fused that thumb, so that's why it's shorter, and, and, they, and, they, and they stuck a pin through there, and so the pin was sticking out. It wasn't painful, and I had to go back, like, I don't know, a week later to get the pin out, and all the monks were just joking with me. They said, oh, they're just going to take a pliers and pull it out, Viridamo. Oh, oh, and, <laughs> you know, monks, boys will be boys, and so... <laughs> So then um, we get in the van and I have to drive the same route, obviously, to the hospital. And it was interesting. It's like PTSD. I just kind of remembered the, the, the hyperventilation and my mind went there. <gasps> so then I went into the doctor's office and he had the, the pliers that, that they were joking about. <laughs> oh, no, please. And he pulled it out and there was no pain. That was interesting. I, I mean, I was really afraid. So then, anyway, so concentration, this is this, I, I got a bit lost there. So, con and, and, and so concentration for me is, 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 is a word which is very much about, uh, about the object. And, and maybe it's a different word for you, but, but what I'm interested in is, 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 is the awareness of objects changing. Because it seems to me that is the perspective that leads to the un that opens to the unconditioned, whereas focusing on an object, like if I hold my mind on an object, I can certainly make it very calm, and if I eliminate all other objects, it could be very peaceful. But I I didn't find that when I let go of that object that it had changed anything, whereas if I did the other, if I emphasized awareness, I mean it's just it's me, right? You guys got to <laughs> judge for yourselves. Uh, if I emphasize the awareness more than the object and began to trust in that, then there was a different result. And I found a more interesting result. So that's the way I think of Samma Samadhi. How can I sustain for long periods of time a mind which is bright, aware, present, composed to the way things are? And um, that to me seems very portable concentrating on something uh, refined and, 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 and small or whatever seems to me re to require um, perfect conditions. Silence, um, no sickness, no pain maybe. Um, whereas this, what we're doing doesn't really require special conditions. It helps. You know, it's much more difficult in, in a confused and chaotic situation, but you can say, oh, this is, this is really confused and chaotic. Can't do that. So then, it, then Sama Samadhi becomes much more integrated into life. If, it, if it's just about focusing on an object, how does it fit into the committee meeting you're at? What are you going to do? Just focus on something and disappear and lose your job? <laughs> yeah. So it, does Sama Samadhi have a relevance in, in, in ordinary life. And so do you have the, 
the entire eightfold path in ordinary life? Or is it just seven factors? And then when you're on retreat, you do Sama Samadhi. To me, it doesn't compute. Not to dismiss, you know, the, the, the kind of levels of concentration that people can have and they can be effective. But Lompa Cha taught, that's what I remember. You know, he just taught like Tamada, ordinary, and more, more the capacity to investigate. And um, we were never really encouraged to, to develop jhanas and things like that. I mean, I could get into that too. There's a whole different way of interpretation of jhanas as being composure rather than concentration. But that's another, uh, another story. So to this person, um, it would seem to me that what you do on a retreat should, if it's integrate, it should integrate into ordinary life. I don't think it should be two things. And I think what we're doing would, would integrate into ordinary life. Your, your, your reflective capacity is stronger. Your ability to know the delusions in your mind is stronger. Your capacity to witness, uh, to see cause and effect, all of that I think is strengthened in this, in this very, very ordinary way. And that will play out. You'll see, it will, uh, for a while. <laughs> and then we'll have another retreat. And we'll start again. And so that's just my take on it. You, you know, you have to figure that one out too, but to me, it seems effective. So there's a bunch of words that someone's asking, could you please elaborate on sati, sampajanya, awareness, awaken? So for me, sati, to me, is the awakened mind. Uh, and what is awakened? Well, it's like this. Sorry. <laughs> I can't give you more than that. And what's the asleep mind? Um, well, you're, you're, you're somehow lost. You're not present, right? Um, and and, and the, the problem, you know, we say awaken, you think you're looking for something called awaken, which is really a classic kind of um, conundrum because <laughs> to look, <laughs> to try to find awaken, I mean, you're just here now. It's just very, very simple. But as soon as we give a name to it, oh, I have to find awakened. <laughs> Where is it? Over here? <laughs> and so then we start to look for something called the awakened mind. Right? Okay. All right. I'm going to notice the awakened mind. <laughs> and we do that, don't we? Because of tanha and all the rest of it. And yet it's so very simple. Um, it, like Gompa Chaz, it's a very simple and because it's so simple, I think we miss it. So I've been using sound. I think that's a kind of a good entryway into it. And when you know sound is sound, and that's the awakened mind. Again, because it, and it's a neutral thing, sounds are very ordinary, I'm emphasizing the awakened mind rather than the quality of sound. That's why I use neutral things. And then if you get that, then of course you, you, you get what it means to be uh, aware of uh, uh, negative emotions or, or panic attacks or, or whatever it might be. And sati all, all, oftentimes is also used in, in conjunction with the theme. So anapanasati or um, sati of, uh, of anicca. So quite often it has a, has a kind of dharmic theme in it so that it, it directs your, your attention in the correct way. So anapanasati. A mindfulness of in and out, uh, or mindfulness of uh, anicca. So that's what I was teaching a fair bit. I'd say, listen to sound, notice the changing nature of sound. So that's sati of anicca. And I think that's very profitable. And certainly Lompa Cha, always uncertainty, uncertainty. And, and again, I, was, I think I mentioned there are sort of levels as Buddhists where we consider uncertainty. This is a kind of overall level that the weather is changing which is pretty ordinary and then there's a level of uncertainty in terms of social uh situations or health which we talk about but then there's that level of moment by moment uh sati of change and that's what i was trying to indicate and i think that's very powerful because it always brings you to really be aware of change you can't attach to an object you have to always recede into awareness and that, I think, is a, is a doorway to liberation. Um, 
Sampajanya is, we, in English, we say clear comprehension. And what does that mean? Well, you, you know what's going on, even if you're confused. You can be really confused and know, well, I'm really confused. <laughs> so it's not necessarily intellectual clarity or, or even, even having an answer. So like, let's say, if you ask me, what's the square root of 684? You know, it'll take me a while. So I haven't done that square roots for a long time. So, so I don't know, right? But I know that I don't know. And that's the knowing we're talking about, clear comprehension, as opposed to thinking that you're always, your mind is always clear, you always understand everything, you know, intellectually, you have an answer from, that's not life. When you have the flu, you don't understand anything. <laughs> your mind is like porridge. And, oh yeah, porridge feels like this, clear comprehension, benyang ni eng. Uh, awareness, awaken, sati, awareness. I use them synonymously. Um, some people parse them out into different ways. So it's not really about the words. The words are just pointing to that state of benyang ni eng. So the, um, what? I was just trying to remember, I think it was Lompa Putatat or someone or Lompa Cha maybe. They used to use a phrase in Thai, Dua Gu Kon Gu, yeah? Well, what does that mean? Is that like ego? Ahankra Mimankra, uh, I thinking, my thinking? Okay, I and mine. Okay, yeah. The Lompa Cha would use that a lot, Lompa Putta that a lot. And, and so is that common parlance in Thai culture or is that just for like monks or everyone uses it? Yeah. And, and so how would you use it? Like, uh, like give me a sentence, but in English where <laughs> it's, Oh, okay, all right. And it, and it has a kind of coarse sense to it. Uh, all right. Yeah, I always thought that. It's kind of coarse, right? Yeah. As opposed to like, so in, 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 in the Fetter's teaching, we have Sakaya Ditti, which is personality view, which is to some extent that kind of coarseness. But we also have a, a, a Asmimana is another word for the sense of self. And, and, uh, that is that is much more subtle, and that's in, I think in the interviews that we were talking about this, that's more like the sense of me doing something, and and as you meditate and as your mind becomes more silent, you start to question that. And we like I think especially if you if you like really holding your mind on an object, and you're just holding your mind after a while. Oh, I'm tired. I'm tired. Do I have to? You know, and who anyway? Who has to do this? And who's doing it? And, and that is not like the gross sense of I, it's more like the doer. And that's in, in, in Buddhist philosophy, we talk about non-duality. Uh, and, and, and so if you are able to notice the doer and it's subtle, then that also ceases. And then that's what we mean by sunyata. So sunyata has a kind of, I guess, level. I'm not sure, I don't know how the commentators say, but for me, there's that level of, um, what am I going to do tomorrow? And uh, did I ever give a good talk? Or oh, I wish I hadn't said that joke. Or <laughs> that's what my mind thinks. Um, the kind of sense of self as thought and, and self self identity. But there's a more subtle kind too, and that you 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 touch when your mind becomes more silent, and, and you you still have a sense you're trying to do something. You're trying to figure something out. You're trying to get somewhere. But it's not so much in thought as in a kind of attitude. So to, to counter that, that's why I use language like non-becoming, non-resistance, to kind of get, get to that kind of space. Okay, I think I covered it. Maybe there's one, one more. Let me see. Oh, not here. Um, can you suppress negative thoughts without it being forced? Um, well, the, there's the word suppress. And in, in usual English language, suppress does imply force. 
Um, but if you, like, if I had a thought, I'm going to kill my brother, I'm going to kill the next door neighbor, I'm going to, it's probably good to suppress that thought. So you could see maybe, maybe somewhere there, but I don't think the, this person is suffering from that. Uh, but more to, to realize that you can, you can have negative thinking, which can be driven by a very strong negative emotion. So um, someone cheats me and I get really harmed by it. And I have a lot of troubles because they cheated me and uh, it's really impacted me. I might be carrying a whole load of anger. And so um, that anger comes up as I'm going to get back to them and I'm going to go to the police and I hate them and I hate them and I hate their mother too. And, <laughs> and it goes on and on. <laughs> And, and that load of negativity, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to just to bear with it. And if you try to do metta bhavana on top of that, that would probably be suppression, right? Um, but if you just pursued it and said, and plotted to, you know, do them in, then, whoa, 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 wait, 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 panati Um So you, you'd have to, and these are the extremes of emotion. Or the extreme, yeah, I had a lot of fear, so... I couldn't really get away from it. I had to just let it come up. But I didn't have to go to the thinking. So the difference between a, a huge emotional load and the thinking driven by that emotional load. So there's a difference between really being angry at the person that cheated me and then the mind comes up, oh, they did this, they did this to me and they did that. No, what does anger feel like? Yeah, but they did this and they did that. No, 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 what does anger feel like? So now you're, you're moving away from the thought but you're still recognizing the, the power of that negative emotion. And then it wears out. But then there's a lot of things which are just, just habit, just bad habit. Just, you know, like complaining about something or, or just criticizing yourself for no good reason, but that's what you've done for 20 years. <laughs> you know, good. Um, and they don't have an emotional load, right? And there, if you're awake to it, you can just choose a different sense base. So thought is one sense, uh, the mind is one sense base, but sound is another sense base. So you can move, right? You can lie, I can look here, or I can feel that, or I can look there. So that's, that, that's okay. And that's done in full mindfulness. And those are, that's the way we deal with most of our habits. You know, they're just, just uh, it's just like, like habit is just that funny. It's just like, it goes that way because it's used to going that way. And, and to lift ourselves out of the habit, we just say, I'm not going there. Don't go there. But that's not suppression. That's in full awareness. And so there's a range between there. And I think what you have to look at is just the compulsion to not, uh, the compulsion to, to, to change things without knowing them. So our, 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 the, our recommendation in, in Buddhism is to, first of all, know. Well, that's the thinking pattern. So labeling is good for that. Yeah, you label it. Yeah, worry. But if it has no real emotional load, then, then you're warned. Oh, yeah, the mind is now moving in the kind of momentum of worry. And it comes up, don't go there. It comes up, don't go there. Or, yeah, okay, but what does the breath feel like? Yeah, okay, but what does the breath feel like? So it's just a very, very mindful movement towards uh, another sense base. And, and, and much of it is, like, I'd go to Lompoc Sumedho and I said, like, oh, when I was a work monk and Chitter said, oh, this monk isn't working and that monk is lazy. And then he said, don't make it a problem. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> and it, it was just a habit of problem making that I didn't really have to do. And, and then I'd go and make the problem. <laughs> But we, we published a newsletter in New Zealand, I remember once. We used to publish one every two months or something. And it had a bunch of stuff. And at the back, there was a quote, don't make it a problem, Lompo Sumedho. And it was the best newsletter we ever did. Because it was just so direct. It's so very helpful. Uh, okay, I think, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. <clears throat> อันธรรมยังธรรมคทายาสาธุกรังธรรมเสสาธุสาธุสาธุอนุโมทามิ
Before we do the chant, this, I was reminded I wanted to read one more from Opa, and then we'll do the chant. People have asked me about my own practice. This is Lumpa Cha speaking. People have asked me about my own practice. You've probably, you've probably seen this. I've read this so many times. How do I prepare my own mind for meditation? There is nothing special. I just keep it where it always is. They ask, are you then an arahat? Do I know? I'm like a tree full of leaves, blossoms, and fruit. Birds come to eat and to nest. Yet the tree does not know itself. It follows its nature. It is as it is. Cool. Huh?